Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Philip Beresic from Rendezvous to the podcast. Welcome, Philip. Thank you, Jason, for having me. Uh, and it's, great it's so on good. how my last name is so difficult, you managed to pull it off. Congrats. Thank you. I try not to butcher people's names if I can at all help it. But as I told you off air, this English speaking tongue doesn't always make the right noises to say everybody's name exactly right. But I do my best. Yeah, and thank you thank for the efforts as well. <laughs> no worries, man. No worries. Now, we've been trying to make this happen. We've been trying to connect up, I think, for a couple of months now. And just our schedules, We were. I was back down in New Zealand for a wedding. You were traveling. So we finally were able to make this happen. And I'm really looking at, forward to talking about Rendezvous today. But before we get into that, what got you into this world, this crazy world of e-commerce? What drew you into that? Tell us just a little bit about your background, the elevator pitch of your background, and how you got into this industry to begin with, and what interested you about the industry. Yeah, happy to share. So how I got into e-commerce was actually almost 10 years ago when SAP acquired Hybris, now called Subcommerce Cloud, and I was part of the innovation lab at SAP back at the time, doing some uh, e-commerce research, research and writing some thesis on that topic. Also got a few, ta- uh, few patents that I sold back time. And then somehow I stayed in e-commerce in that space. I was mostly in a B2C e-commerce and then online shops, the basic stuff. And then uh, later on, I was building my own uh, e-commerce business or marketplace platform business more to, to be more precise. And also I was uh, building the tech for SAP's platform business. So SAP itself is running a marketplace business. It's a B2B platform, B2B marketplace. And I was one of the tech on the team, which was building out the capabilities which you need on a platform on a marketplace business because a lot of people think marketplace or platform is seems like an online shop but after you scratch under the surface there is a lot of differences which you cannot uh, day one and i was actually building out all those uh, those things for sap itself and then one of so i'm tech by training tech by background uh, and doing software development software engineering software architecture almost my whole professional life and one of my uh, great friends also a tech person who was building marketplaces for uh, different startups here in Germany or in Singapore, uh, uh, realized there is a, a lot of reinventing of the wheel and, and a lot of reinventing the, of the wheel and uh, a lot of mess in the development process and a lot of cost for the businesses itself. And he was thinking there should be a, a other way, a modern way, a different approach, how to build that tech. And he came up with the idea of rendezvous. And at the beginning, uh, I didn't get him at all <laughs> because it was a, a completely new approach in a sense. I understood all the problems because uh, I experienced them uh, myself. But then after some uh, deep dive, more talks, I, I realized what is the idea and we decided to start building together Rendezvous. So two tech guys solving their own tech problems, which you have when you're building e-commerce platforms and marketplace businesses. So that's uh, how we uh, uh, got in here so far. It was not really an elevator pitch. It's a bit longer than 60 seconds, but I try to make it short. No, that look, that's fantastic. I really appreciate you walking me down memory lane there and, and helping us understand how you were effectively scratching an itch. And obviously, since you come from the big tech background, like Hybris is, is a very large scale platform. It covers many use cases very expensive. I knew a lot of agencies that were working with Hybris back in the day when it reached the peak of its popularity. And it was a very expensive platform for merchants to get into and very complex builds were, it used to be that it was a minimum of a million dollars to get into a Hybris implementation. It was a minimum of 12 months. I knew lots of Hybris implementations that took 18 to 24 months in terms of implementation. And then of course, you've got all the considerations around integration. If they're not running SAP on the back end, then you've got all the other custom integrations with CRMs, OMSs, WMSs. And so Hybris is a heavy duty platform. And I guess coming from that background, how did it shape your view of the platform landscape and how you may want to do things similarly or 
differently to how SAP does things because SAP is a big, heavy duty enterprise platform that's for enterprise merchants doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. It's really not designed for SMBs in any way. It, SAP has no desire to democratize access to their platforms. They are targeted 100% at the enterprise. And if you're not an enterprise, they really don't want you as a customer because their pricing kind of excludes SMBs. So did that kind of shape your thinking about what the market actually needed when you were deciding how you were going to engineer, how you were going to deliver? how you were going to price Rendezvous? It would be not honest to say yes. <laughs> it was more the technical drivers that were uh, bringing us to, to reshape and, and the product innovation and their approach to development. Hybris or sub commerce cloud today, it's a great product in itself, but it's a, in a sense old product. It was started in, if I remember well, 1999 in Munich, and it has all this old philosophy of software development. It's really low level. And if you want to, you have a lot of power, but with a great power comes a lot of responsibility. But in order to tackle that, you really need the highly trained developers that know hybrids inside out, that are, they need at least six, eight, nine months of training just to be able to move a needle a bit. Because in order to, to change something, you need to go deep into the source code, have it on your local machine, change it, test it. And that's how it was done. And decades ago, and it was the best of, I would say, best of reads back then. It was one actually great, it actually great product engineering from inside. The source code is great. The architecture is grow, uh, great. The patterns are great, but it's an old pattern. Um, and, and that's why it requires uh, such a long implementation cycles, because we also first need to find people that uh, know it, and then it's, it's also really tough, and then you have to start it, and you have to keep going. And we wanted to change that. We want to, uh, to change the speed of iterations of development, iteration and speed of changes. So we know that approach, both to myself and other co-founder who is tech. And we also look at the other approach of the market where you have these white label solutions. So they're pretty packed and you need to fit yourself in. So you cannot just change anything because it's not made for that. It's made to be easy, accessible. If your business fits in, if your use case fits in, great, awesome. Best tool to use, I would highly recommend it. But if you need to change anything, even a slightly difference, there is no way because it was not being made to be changed. It was a, a, a platform for business people. So we tried, okay, how we can combine these two worlds with the new uh, technology trends, which we have commercialized since 2014, 2015, how we can take these advantages of, of enterprises where you have the great power to change everything and how to make it easy as possible and without requiring this highly train specialized developers that need months of training. And that how idea came in existence to have this iteration of development in, not in every space, but in a platform e-commerce marketplace, B2B commercial space. And now that catches us up to where Rendezvous is today. And in, in all transparency, I haven't worked with Rendezvous before, so I have to take what's on the tin and say, that's what the platform is. But as far as I understand it, this is heavily targeted at B2B merchants, B2B digital commerce capabilities, B2B digital commerce platform. It's a four in one SaaS development platform, meaning that you're delivering it uh, as a SaaS delivery. It's not an on-premise platform or technology. And it provides a whole bunch of out of the box functionality that most B2Bs need, B2B businesses and brands need. What was the the motivation for focusing so heavily on B2B merchants? What was it, when you looked out there, what was it that told you, hey, B2B commerce is coming, it's growing, it's exploding, it's sure, it's immature, it's nascent, we're probably 10 to 15 years behind B2C and D2C, but it's coming, the wave is coming, because you started developing this long before COVID came along. And so the reality is that COVID only accelerated the need for B2B brands to be able to do Digital And in many instances, B2Bs historically have said, we do punch out or we do e-procurement or we're, we do EDI. That's our digital commerce. And so we don't need a self-service digital commerce solution. But I tell you, COVID taught them something different when sales reps could no longer go and see people on site and make site visits and go and have and meet with their accounts. And so when we think about it through that lens, you were ahead of the curve in recognizing what B2B brands needed to be successful digitally. What was that crystal ball that you were looking into that told you B2Bs are going to need this capability? 
Yeah, so basically, again, with BLIs, I would say we had a B2B vision. That's how we started. <laughs> we started as a, as a tech guys that want to solve the tech problems of building. And usually we had the mostly B2C use cases in our heads. We had the Airbnbs of this world. We had Uber of these worlds. We have DoorDash of these worlds. We have these platforms where two or more sites are connecting in a sense. And we wanted to build a platform for developers where they can build actually what is being matched. And that's also the idea of the name rendezvous, which means a date in, in French and on a platform, it's actually two for whatever approach for some value exchange. So it could be products, it could be services, it could be something different. And we want to build a platform for that uh, case, which is powerful and gives a developer a tool to modify it to its needs in a B2B, uh, in a, a e-commerce space. And then when we started meeting and all these use cases from B2B, where people were asking, oh, is this possible this, can you do this feature? Can I have my personalized terms and condition for this party? And mostly for all of those questions, the answer was yes, just a few clicks, because we did not pre-build white label solution. We built a development tool, which allows you to build your stuff way efficiently and way faster without the coding. But then we le uh, uh, learned that in every industry, uh, every B2B industry is so specific and they have so specific needs and so different needs. So there is not possible to build one solution to fit every use case, but we are on a lower level, which allows you to customize that uh, uh, use case. So we understood actually what we built is so powerful in the B2B context. Let's move there because there people appreciate way more peace because they understand it and we solve those problems immediately. And in B2C space, more or less is standardized, similar, and they don't need so much changes like in B2B where you start and you come to the market and learn. For example, to give an example, one of our customers, when they launched and start, it's a B2B platform in a plastic molding industry. At some point they learned that when they onboarded the bigger customers on their platform, they said, I'm a big company. I don't want to have standardized terms and conditions. I don't want to have standardized commissions. I don't want to have a standardized, whatever I have my own personalized stuff. And they call us like, Hey, can we change this stuff? Can we build this stuff? Yeah, of course. And it took us less than a two day to roll out some changes and they're happy and they could onboard their customer compared to other solutions say, yes, it's possible, but now we need a hybrid developer or whatever developer is going to take us three, four or five months to roll it out, to test it. This was only a, a friction of change and they were already on the market, continuing their uh, uh, momentum. So the, the shift from B2C to B2B came from learning from the market and, and seeing that this flexibility, which we offer and the speed actually is more valued in that space, uh, than in B2C cause it's more uh, needed. Yeah. No question about that. Flexibility is key, especially in B2B because there are so many B2B use cases out there. And so if you had to compare uh, so yourself, just, 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 just to give an example. So all of our B2B customers are from different industries and none of them look alike. So they have different onboarding processes for the commercials, commercial onboarding for their participants. They have different transactions. They have different payment methods. They have different terms. They have different, uh, some of them have negotiations included green different price, price some lists, of them, different MOQs. Yes. Some of them have, you cannot even see the products or the listings of companies you're not connected with. So you have several distributors on one side, several retailers on one side, but you're allowed only to see the products of the distributors that accepted you to, to do commerce or you need to sign some different contracts. And so every, that's kind of, and it's also a bit challenging for us to explain because it's put us in tough position to say, we are this use case. We are an uh, underlying use case where you can build your use case in, in a sense. So that's the, I would say the beauty of B2B the one on one side, but on the other side also challenging how to communicate uh, that. And so are you designing the platform have, is the intention of the platform to be able to fulfill the use case of say a manufacturer selling to wholesalers and distributors, as well as operating um, a marketplace. So now the platform has expanded beyond the marketplace use case. Now it's, it supports the ability for brands and manufacturers to sell directly their own inventory, their own owned inventory to their wholesalers and distributors. And then for that matter. For wholesalers and distributors to be able to sell their own inventory to businesses that either consume or resell that those products into the retail market so you now have come full circle and you've built on the additional functionality to move way beyond the pure marketplace capability and that's even a basic use case so the more interesting use case is when you start opening up new sites on your platform so 
on the B2C space. So Airbnb, when Airbnb started, they had a two sides. One side, people uh, having renting out accommodation, other side, tourists booking accommodation. But later on, Airbnb opened a new line of business where you have experienced providers, travel agents, so people that are offer some experience. So they have three-sided platform. And you can also learn, see in this B2B space, they start with two sides and then they learn, oh, I onboarded this one side, but actually those two sides, that one side, they would have, they would prefer also they have a value exchange between them. So they have now two transactions on two sides or later on even onboard a third side, which is connected on a platform. So they start out of a typical marketplace, building an ecosystem of having different parties, different sides from that industry and digitalizing their operations in a sense and their commerce. Yeah, we see this actually. It was a bit complicated. No, no, no we see this very <laughs> often actually. Or... We, we actually see this very often. It's very rare that even a manufacturing brand makes all of the products that they sell. So sometimes they'll, maybe they manufacture 20%, 30% of their catalog. Maybe they're a distributor or a wholesaler for another 60 or 70% of their catalog. And then maybe what they wanna do for the remainder, for the additional 10 or 20% of their catalog, maybe they just wanna be a marketplace. They don't actually want to hold inventory. And so oftentimes in the B2B space, a brand is, has multiple ways of selling. That they, they will, they're a manufacturer, they're a wholesaler, a distributor, and they're a marketplace all in one. And they need that capability to be able to have the flexibility to sell in whichever way that they want. And in fact, even for some of the products that they carry, and actually in theory, they've got it in their ERP, they've got it in their PIM, they've got the official pricing. In some instances, they want those products to be drop shipped. And so there's another method of selling. There's another effectively another channel of being able to sell. And so when you get into the B2B world, the business models start to get really murky. And oftentimes a brand will have two, three, four, five B2B business models underneath the one roof, depending on the product, the supplier, the price, where it's being shipped from. And they have all these rules around whether they're going to sell it first party, whether they're going to sell it first party but drop ship selling it third party where effectively they're just the all they're doing is monetizing their traffic in some cases they're selling kits and bundles and packages so they're actually a solution provider as opposed to a SKU provider and so sometimes they'll manufacture let's say they've got a big kit or a bundle or a solution maybe one or two of those items they manufacture themselves but the rest they've brought in from the market they've bundled it together and now they're selling it as a packaged solution into the industry so there's a lot of different i guess methods that these b2b brands are pulling together products and then getting them out into their customers hands and if you don't have a flexible platform it's very difficult to support those different business models and channels exactly exactly and, not, and, and what's also on, on top of it every of those channels has a different transaction different value exchange process. So in some processes, I need approval. So if somebody orders on one channel, then I need three-step approval from my from, from a merchant. If someone is like, if Jason is ordering for me because he's my great customer for a long time, there is no approval. Automatically it's approved if it's a different threshold. So do you have every, this channel might have a different process. We call it value exchange transaction process uh, behind it. So you also have to have in your hands the power to, to model it, to, to, to make it. And also, what's also interesting in a B2B space, it's not always about the products. There's always also a lot about services. So we also have a B2B platforms. I call them more platforms because I see a marketplace only a business model as a one of business models on a platform itself. And a platform is, in a sense, or B2B commerce as well. Two companies getting matched for something. It could be a product. It could be an RFQ process. It could be a quotation. It could be about certain industry. We also see a lot of B2B services being acquired or bought uh, through platforms and there you don't have a typical, typical catalog you can browse and select. So there we have, we call it a reverse auction transaction. So basically what it does, you post your needs in a sense. If you uh, saw so an example is this plastic molding platform operator, they know how purchasing of those custom made machines, it works in that industry. So they made an RFQ process on, on the platform when one company says, hey, my needs are, and those are needs not gener gen generic needs. Those needs are very data model data. So it's very specific for, for that uh, industry. And when they started working with us, I didn't know none of those. 
specific terms. They had to explain us what it actually means from the business side so they can uh, roll it out. And the transaction goes in a way you submit more or less your requirements, and then somehow the platform says, hey, here is one provider that could work, work out for you. And then you start negotiation process, maybe sign NDAs, then you may disclose data, which you're not disclosing uh, previously. So those processes in a B2, in a service uh, space are also getting, I would say, digitalized and getting on the platforms. And I see there also a huge trend in that space. Yeah, we're effectively saying, put in a bid. Put in a bid for the job, put in a bid for the solution, put in a bid for the technology or the platform or the services around that for the installation. And we even see that when, for example, if we're talking a telecommunications company that is largely B2B, they're selling telecommunications products, hardware, maybe it's internet, maybe it's routers, maybe it's handsets for businesses, maybe it's mobile devices for businesses, etc. But then they also have additional services layers that go on top of that. So they've got warranties, they've got installations, they've got support, they've got, they've got all these different packages that go along that are conditional, depending on the physical goods that are being sold in, then the package of services and support and warranties go along with that and maybe even an upgrade, a trade-in and upgrade process that is included with that bundle or package. So now we're getting into more RFQ combined with CPQ process where we now need to say, okay, cool, what are your needs? Here's our packages that we have to offer. Now you can select, okay, you can select from the package of hardware, you can select from the package of software, you can select from the package of installation. Do you need help with installation or don't? You can select from the package of the warranty period, one year, two year, three year, five year warranty period. You can sign up for an upgrade process that's included with the bundle. So there's a lot of optionality oftentimes in these B2B transactions that look exactly. a lot more like an individually negotiated transaction as opposed to here's a SKU and here's the price for the SKU. Exactly. There was a lot of, we call them add-ons, which are being bought through the main, we call it supply or value of unit, which you're actually getting on the platform. And beside the complexity you mentioned, you also had another complexity and those are conditional. So it's not like standardized. If you have one product, then those are the options. So it could be from every product, you have different logic, what could be offered on top. And another layer of complexity is that it's so industry unique that for every industry, it looks different. Of course, it's called RFQ or whatever the name is, they use it. But if you look at the details, only high level is the same. Hey, these are my needs, done. But the value of chain, how that looks like, what, they, what the companies are negotiating, uh, exposing to, disclosing to each other, agreeing on terms, payment methods, this data which is being there collected, generated is from every industry, I would say completely different. Yeah, I mean, telecommunications, for example, is vastly different than insurance. And in insurance, there's a whole new set of considerations and a whole new set of approval processes that have to go along. And when we think of those two industries, they're very different. They're selling, some are selling physical and digital products combined. One is selling a pure services model, a pure, a pure digital products model, so to speak. And there's a whole different series that goes along with it. And then if we're selling domestic insurance, versus pure business insurance via a business, maybe it's medical or health insurance, via a group plan, an HMO type of plan through a business. Again, very different process, very different requirements, very different processes that are attached to each stage of the buying and purchasing process and validations that have to be approved, uh, validations and approvals. It, it can get really complex really fast. And so it sounds like what you guys have done is you've said, hey, look, this traditional idea of just selling phys physical goods door to door doesn't always plug in cleanly in the B2B world. The B2B world is just messy, just inherently. It's a messy industry. And when you get into some of those really complex verticals, what they need is so different to the traditional buy a product, bring it in, stick it in our warehouse, add a markup to it or, or send it to our 3PL, add a markup to it, sell it on our website ship it to their door, this can be very different. That whole entire process, which is so clean, relatively speaking, in the B2C and D2C world, it looks very different in the B2B world. And in, sometimes in the B2B world, we're not even shipping it directly to the customer. We're shipping it maybe to a job site, for example. If it's a, if it's a building site, we need building materials. And then we need, for example, in the building industry, they might make a massive half a million dollar order for building supplies 
but then part of that order will be shipped today to a job site. Then part of that order, they want to arrive a month from now when they start the plumbing. Then a month later, they want some flashings and finishings and roofing. And then a month after that, they want the carpeting to arrive because that's when the job requires it. But they want to make the entire purchase up front so they don't have to keep logging in to make these purchases every month. They want to place the entire order, but they want to put rules around when the order is actually processed by line item or by group of line items. So when we get into the B2B world, it, it, okay, the commerce gets ahead. really messy in the B2B world. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. And to add on top of that use case, and sometimes some companies that make a huge uh, order, they say, and for the shipment, please use my uh, partner. For example, use USPS because yeah, F -F 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 there I have a special. We're going to send it out. Because I have a special terms with them. Please use my, my, my account for shipping. And other companies say, I don't care, please ship it uh, the way how you ship it yourself, the best uh, way how you ship your own stuff, your stolen goods. So also have that complexity on top after it's coming, after you already uh, mentioned all that before earlier. So there's uh, a lot of variables that could be tweaked in, in every use case. And then I guess we have the added complexity in the B2B world oftentimes that there are the person who is doing the procurement of goods isn't always the person that is going to be using those goods. So someone, maybe a, qu a quoting specialist inside the business generates the buying list and then they hand it off to a procurement specialist who knows actually nothing about the products that they're buying. They are, their, their whole job is just procurement. So if you don't make it easy for the procurement specialist, for the actual buyer of the goods to complete that transaction easily and seamlessly and to find the items, to find alternatives if something has been deprecated and replaced with an alternative item, if we don't create an opportunity for the cross-sells and the upsells that, that is intelligible, if we don't create the opportunity to download collateral, for example, the spec sheets, the exploded diagrams, all of the flow rates for pumps and various different complex industrial supplies, et cetera, and the capabilities of certain products, if we don't make that easy for procurement teams to get access to that data so that they can order the right product for the right job in the right scenario, man, you are not going to be a preferred supplier if you don't remove all that friction from that buying process. Because at the end of the day, your whales are probably going to be buying by EDI. Your smallest, your smallest players need something else. They need oftentimes self-service e-commerce. And then the brands in the middle, the, the people that are going to be buying off you in the middle, maybe they've got an e-procurement process that needs to connect you via punch out. But in all cases, there are digital services over and above the transaction that you still need to be able to extend to them through digital channels, being able to lodge an RMA request, a return merchandise authorization request, being able to download their catalog in a PDF if necessary, being able to log in and see what their pricing is, seeing what their availability, their unique catalog availability, their restricted catalog for that buyer is being able to request a quote through the platform, even if we don't transact and execute the transaction through the platform, being able to request a quote or even be able to request a new type of product, a new SKU that doesn't yet, either they don't sell yet or hasn't been made available to that specific buyer yet to be able to request that product and being able to say, look, if we buy a thousand units of this, what's our price? And if we buy 2000 units of this, what's our price? And what's the lead time uh, for you to get that to us in each of those cases? So in the B2B world, we have people oftentimes trying to help the business execute a transaction who are not necessarily specialists in those items to begin with. And we have to make that entire process of buying, receiving, receipting, getting billed for, paying for, and then returning in certain cases. We have to make all that entire process frictionless. Otherwise, we're not going to be the preferred supplier. Definitely. And... And I thought it should not be only accessible, it should be uh, now with the new generation, younger generations coming to, to those roles also look sexy because the B2B software usually now looks like uh, eye cancer and it has to become looking sexy. It has to become uh, looking more intuitive and easier to use. Modern. And those modern and, and those, those requirements and non-functional requirements should be also considered 
if you're planning to dominate your industry in a sense. And are you guys, do you consider yourself a monolithic platform, meaning that you provide the front end, you provide the admin back end, you provide the API connectivity layer uh, for integrations to other platforms, you've got the, an order orchestration layer, as I understand it. So you consider yourself an all-in-one solution that if, the, if they want to build a headless front end and then integrate with your platform via API, great. But if they need a front end, that you can provide that as well in a SaaS way, in a, in, a, in a subscription way. So you can be that all-in-one glue that ties these businesses together digitally with their customers. Yes. Yeah, so we started as an API-first company, going back as a tech people solving tech problems, which we have. So we started as a tech-first company, API-first company. Then we also learned that customers, especially in the mid-market, do not have their own tech resources. And uh, they're not willing to get the tech resources. They want to get something out of the box in a sense. So we also included the front end, which you can of course use. So some of the customers use it, the front end themselves. Some customers have, so you have in a, in a platform sense, you have, I would say two different strategies for the front ends. You have one, we call it partner approach. People know it from Amazon maybe. So there you have one front end, one storefront, if you're going to buy as a, as the buyer, amazon.com, and you have another front end if you're a seller, it's seller.amazon.com. So it did two, those are two different front ends, two different software projects, two different software ar artifacts. And you also have another approach where you have a unified front end. Uh, example is Airbnb in a B2C space. So if you're uh, booking something on Airbnb, if you want to uh, listing your flat on Airbnb, you have only one front end, airbnb.com, and you do everything there. So it's up, up to company to decide what approach they want to go. They want to have one, uh, our own front end, which is serving every participant side, regardless if you have one side intersecting each other, two sides, three sides, or you want to split into two front ends. So we have some, for example, one of some of the customers for one of their sites on the platform, they use our front end. And for the other side of the platform, they use, they build their own front end as they wanted to make it really sexy. And they put a, a, a they put a, a budget in place to develop their own custom front end. That's very industry uh, uh, specific. So we are not limiting you or uh, saying this is the way. Usually, what we say to to people that start talking with us, uh, we advise them to start using our front end just to be on the market, to go on the market as fast as possible. So we call it a lean, and then learn from your customer actually what do you need because oftentimes. You have customers that have these ideas, assumptions, we need A, B, C, D, and they start investing and, and, and investing in those points. And later on, when they come to the market, they learn it was totally irrelevant. We advise them, hey, try to minimize your scope. So you were saying that oftentimes when they start out, they might start out using your UI, and then maybe they develop something different down the track. Yes, exactly. So they put time and, and money to build that emotion out. And then when they land on the market, they learned nobody cares about it. So we try to always advise them, of course, you can do that you better for us. We make more money, but it doesn't make sense for you in, in a long term. And also it's worse for us in the long term because you're going to spend a budget on the wrong thing. So we usually advise you start with the minimum uh, uh, set of features, also reduce your scope, what is really needed, be on the market, test it and then roll out new stuff because we have this uh, advantage of that rolling out new stuff doesn't take six, nine, 12 months. We have customers that are rolling out new stuff on two, four weekly basis. They roll something, they learn, oh, this was the wrong idea. They remove it, they roll out new thing. And they continuously de deploy and innovate on their, their platform. It's, it's not us who invented it. We, we are just lovers of the lean. We are the lovers of the lean process. Uh, it's not our invention, but I, I think is the way to go also to build out what's actually being needed and required and not building out what you feel it's uh, going to be great. Yeah. Understand the iterative approach and look to start with an MVP, iterate, learn, add new functionality. That's always the smarter way to go as opposed to build the big bang. The big bang theory of commerce is a long forgotten idea, right? And we don't need to boil the ocean nowadays. We can start quite fast. We can run a proof of concept, we can iterate, we can build it, we can enhance, we can extend, and we can learn ultimately at the end of the day because our customers are going to tell us what they want, what they need. And as far as I understand, you also provide the partner business facing UI so that, for example, if I want to run uh, a third-party marketplace where other businesses can list their products on my website, 
I can set rules and I can say, okay, cool. You want to list your products on the website. Here you go. Here's an interface where you can upload the products. We're going to automatically add say 5% or 10% or whatever our margin is to that. Or we can say, okay, here's the, here's our rules. We're going to say, we're going to take a 5% commission on everything you sell. So you set your price however you want it but we're going to take 5% or 10% off of every sale. So you can, you provide the interface for those businesses to list their products on your website. You create the interface for the the seller of record, me who's operating the marketplace to set the rules around who can list, what they can list, what the pricing, maybe you need pricing rules and boundaries, any commission rule set, et cetera, and making the trading, the trading terms. We can expose those trading terms to anybody who's listing products on our website in a meaningful way based on a rule set. Exactly. And that rule set is not in stone. You can always change. And we also learned that our customers and their ideas, they change over time because they learned it was a wrong idea not accepted by the market. And then we get, uh, I would say two, in, uh, not say, uh, you get two environments, you get one, we call it sandbox environment. You can test everything in, in your closed circle and internally, and then you release it to production and you see it how, how it goes and then you learn oh it's not working for whatever reason then you change it again you release a new version and you have not only the way how you monetize a platform is not only getting a fixed fee or a commission on transaction there are actually more than 12 revenue models where you can actually as a platform make money and uh, uh, in some industries uh, transaction is transaction volumes are so high that uh, that Platform participants are not willing to pay a commission to, to the platform itself, but they are happy, for example, to pay a platform access a subscription. So for them to be on a platform, they're paying a monthly subscription, which is also different based on how big the company is, which is on the platform. So you have this freedom not only to set the rules, how you're going to monetize your platform participants, but you can also flexibility to monetize around the platform and not only within the transaction. Wow, what? That's crazy levels of flexibility. And you support. can also per, and you can also personalize it. You can also say, for example, if Jason is a listing or Greenwood Consulting as a company is listing their services because we love his podcast and we love what he does for the community, whatsoever he's gonna get uh, better terms. So it's for example three percent uh, commission. But if someone new on board who we don't know uh, and we do not we do not verify it, it doesn't have a, a review a track record so far. It's ten percent, and then. And then you can even go further and say, if your uh, products are from category X and Y, then it's 6%. If it's from category Y and uh, Z, it's 9%. So you have this freedom to combine and, and, and adapt this. And that comes usually not from the platform operator itself. Usually it comes from the market itself because the participants call the platform operator and say, hey, I'm not happy with this deal. I want to change it and then start negotiate, negotiating and talking what would work for them. And currently we have the software solutions. We cannot support that change or they can support if you need a highly specialized developers that know that source code inside out to change it. So usually partners will say, sorry, not possible. It's going to take us six to eight months to roll it out. And here usually it takes up to a week or two to roll it out, depending on your front end custom front end, which you have to display that, that deal. And you also support subscription models as well, right? In what sense? If I want to sign up for a subscription supply of a product to a brand, I want to sign. I want to sign up, and I want to say, "Look, send me, send me a thousand units of this every month." I basically create one PO. I create the purchase, but I say, "Look, this is going to be on a regular purchase cycle, weekly, monthly, six monthly, quarterly, whatever it might be." Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. At this point of time, no, it's still not mm -hmm. in production. It's on the roadmap. At That's this point great. of time. But this is becoming more common in the B2B world. It historically has only ever been common in the B2C, D2C world, but not common in the B2B world. But it's becoming a lot more common in the B2B world, especially for things like if we want to bring in, let's say I'm a, a mall operator or something like that, and I want to bring in every single week, I need to bring in toilet paper and I need to bring in all these different facilities management products to manage my facility, I may want some of those things to be on a subscription so that I don't have to, I don't have to generate an order via EDI every month or something like that. I want this just to happen all on a subscription basis. Definitely. I also know it from the B2C world, uh, especially from Amazon and buying diapers. <laughs> That's one of the uh, things I subscribe to. Uh, uh, but from B2B world, I heard ideas, but I never uh, uh, met a company 
which is actually executing it. I think it will come, uh, it's going to be, mm. become more popular at some point of time, but I, from my personal experience, I did not meet uh, uh, such use case in practice so far. Maybe you know it, because I also saw that you talk to a lot of uh, industries, a lot of experts across the industry, so I'm pretty sure you, you saw it in practice as well. Yeah, and what I'm seeing that's different in the B2B world around subscriptions is that oftentimes it requires an integration between the buyer's system and the seller's system in terms of the min-max inventory sharing uh, model where, okay, cool, I'm tracking, oftentimes via, say, webhooks, I'm tracking the inventory level at a SKU level that the buyer has in their system at any given point in time. And then I have a rule in my system that says, okay, maybe I'm getting an inventory feed update once a day from the buyer and I'm tracking that against their account in my system and they have set min maxes for everything, every SKU that they buy from me. They're telling me, hey, once I get down to this level, just send me 10 more, just send me 100 more, just send me five. So subscriptions in the B2B world take a slightly different form to what they do oftentimes in the B2C and D2C world where there's more of an inventory sharing model and saying, look, we're gonna auto trigger replenishment based on the inventory we still have of that specific SKU that you supply to us. So it's not like a tra necessarily a traditional subscription model, but it's almost like an auto ship, an auto replenishment model. And th that's becoming a lot more popular. It, it, and this is happening even in the world of say, like heavy equipment, say for example, and we've got heavy equipment now that have telematics that ET phone home, okay, this heavy equipment has done this many hours of operation. Now I need to have these, I need the oil changed. I need the hydraulic fluid would change. I need all these routine maintenance things done. That's triggering the purchase off in my system. Now I need to be able to trigger off that procurement in your system. So it's almost an evolution of the EDI model. Yeah, it is uh, first understood it. Basically, uh, every company which is uh, on a purchasing site sets their own thresholds. When they're met, they're automatically going to place an order or place a purchase order, depending on a, on a sense. And yeah, and then I assume then that the payments go not really to subscription managers and subscription it's auto sites. automated. It's just charged to their account, just the on account. And then obviously if they are on credit stop or whatever it might be, then the accounting team can reach out. They can get them to clear a portion of their account or what they can do is they can say, look, until you clear a portion of your account, you can only order with us via business credit card until you pay down your account, for example. So yeah. there's almost like a hierarchy of payment methods that are available to you depending on the status of your credit account with us. So the, and this yeah. speaks to your point, which is that <laughs> there's many different payment methods that need to be supported in the B2B world. It's not just wire transfer. It's not just bank transfer anymore, especially with cross-border and international. It's ACH. It's payment now almost like BNPL in the world. It's installments. It's There's so many different exactly. payment methods that need to be supported in the B2B world now that it's not just your traditional wire transfer model anymore. Exactly. And even direct debits are even getting in place for a smaller, uh, smaller amounts, which has to be, which are going to be charged. It's exciting. Also, it's exciting. And also those payment methods are not only different through industries, they also depend a lot on the market where you are. So they also were very localized and, 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 and they're industry specific and market specific. So you can also have the same industry, which is acting on different markets. And then you need uh, different uh, payment methods for different markets. Yeah, and what I'm finding with a lot of my clients is that their payment terms or their credit terms sometimes are their business advantage. They, that's their unique selling point in the market. If they, for example, if two brands selling into the market effectively look and feel the same and they offer similar products uh, at similar prices, et cetera, but one offers 120-day terms, one offers 30-day terms, who, who's, who's going to win more business? It's probably the 120-day terms brands that can basically, if they've got the resources to extend out their payment terms, oftentimes that is a very competitive advantage in, in, in certain categories that run razor thin margins. And when they need to basically be able to sell those products to be able to pay, they need to be able to, the B2B buyer needs to be able to sell those products into the market before they can pay the supplier, the longer the terms that they can make that happen and effectively be the float, almost like the bank for those B2B buyers, it gives them a massive competitive advantage. Definitely because they can save on cash and, and execute on other operations until even they sell those products and then pay the, the supplier. 100%. But, you can also, but you can also see in that space that platforms are integrating with, uh, I would call them fintech APIs, which are offering you such, uh, I would say, 
buy now pay later loans where the platform itself offers to take the risk of not being not delivering the payment but actually under the hood offloading it to their api integrator they integrating with so you have a big 200k 300k transactions and you through the platform because you're already onboarded on the platform you verify it, especially in the b2b space you just let anyone on the platform the onboarding process commercial onboarding usually takes several steps even multi-approval steps uh, verifications double Credit checks, checks. And so, on. so usually you know very well who is on or acting as a participant in your platform so you can add this value add service within the transaction where you can say to the buyer hey i'm seeing you have this 30 300k deal you want to make the order Maybe here's an offer from us uh, as a platform. You can, we can pay that immediately now to the supplier and you pay through installments if the supplier is not offering such things. And then you pay a small interest to the platform itself and the platform is offsetting the risk of payment not being met to the third party uh, uh, API, uh, um, FinTech uh, API. Yep. Okoto, Balance, there's a number of payments players out there in the B2B space now that are offering that fintech integration, effectively being the payment gateway, but also offering terms via their platform, basically taking on the credit risk and, and extending payment to the cool. merchant immediately, and then managing the receipt and collection of, that, of those payments directly with the buyer through their platform. So this is making it a lot easier for B2B brands and sellers to extend credit terms to their buyers without taking on that credit risk and having to do that deep credit checking. Those platforms do the credit checking on their behalf, which is making it a lot more seamless today to be able to offer terms. I was I was also way faster because without it, usually if you want to make place such order, usually you're going to call someone from the finance department or even CFO and say, hey, can we get this from a bank? Can you call our bank sales agent? Hey, we want to buy this. Can we do And then you, it takes you four to six weeks to get an offer so you can place the order. And here on the platform, it's more or less a click. And then you need a, up to a week just to sync internally with the company if you want to take it or not. And then you're done. So that I think that the risks and uh, the risk, the transactions which are happening on the platform and, and uh, allows for more transactions to happen because now the, the, the seller doesn't have to wait for six to eight weeks on your decision. He has decision by week and he can commit for such time before he sells to another part. Yep, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, obviously, flexibility at every stage of the buying life cycle in the B2B world is a super important thing and it's a massive value add for the sellers that can bring that to the table. Now, uh, if we look out over the next 12, 18, 24 months of your platform development, what for you, and I think you'll need to bring your, your microphone down there. Yeah, uh, I was coughing. Uh, so that's, why I just no, that's fine. That's fine. No, that's fine. If we look at 12, 18, 24 months, what is high on your radar in terms of functionality or capability you want to bring to the platform for your customers? So the majority of it is mostly in the, we call it organizational modeling. So uh, on, on a platform, especially in the B2B space, you, we call them not the users, we call them a participant. A participant is organization. And then in different industries, these organizations have different needs. So if you, that's what we we're talking earlier. Once maybe an organization has a, a procurement person, then has a, a warehouse person, and then it has a, a tech specialist who's going to approve that process. So having one party on the platform, not not a marketplace, but not a platform or just B2B commerce, and having different users who can see and do different things depending on the industry. So we call it yeah, different permission organ- set. Yep. Exactly. And we call it organization modeling because on every industry, on every side, those could be different roles. If you're maybe you don't even have a warehouse person, you maybe have a, another person which is important in that process. So you model out as a, a, a as a new platform, how it's going to work, and then you get the APIs in front of which actually offers you that functionality and it's making custom features that allows you that and spend months of that idea is to get that rolling out in a days. Love it. Love it. And how do you guys make your money? How do you charge? What's your pricing model? Do you charge by <coughs> module? Do you charge by user? Do you charge a transaction fee? What or are you just a month, a straight monthly fee like a SaaS platform would typically be? What's your go-to-market model from a pricing perspective? So we are SaaS based, license based, plus we call it success or shared success fee where platforms pay a percentage of their revenue uh, on top of the monthly license they're paying. And for some customers say, uh, I, w- I want just to pay a high license without a success uh, or share success fee. So they get the license, only monthly license. Other customers 
uh, want to uh, have a higher uh, uh, share success fee and a lower license in a sense, because that, especially in the beginning, if you're on a tight budget, that allows them to decrease the fixed cost and put the co put the budget into the business the development. And it's funny because we started as a tech people as a, uh, with the idea with a free tier, because we, uh, we're coming from tech and usually in tech, you have a free tier, you start using it, and then until some point of time, you start paying. But then we're like giving talks at the conferences, sharing knowledge about the platform, sharing knowledge how that everything works. And the feedback that we got is, does not make sense. Such a cool platform, but it's a free tier. This, it doesn't make sense. So sure. we learned from the market that we need to remove the free tier and introduce the uh, the basic license just to start. And our philosophy is as well, at this point of time, and I hope it's gonna remain like that, is not to charge by features or by the modules, but to give you the whole feature set and all the flexibility because at the end, we are on a shared success model. If our customers are not succeeding it, we are not succeeding as well. So we don't see advantage of them blocking them features which, which could make them flexible, which could make them succeed because we're not getting anything out of it. If we unlock them the features and help them succeed, then we're also getting successful. So that's the, the basic uh, idea. And another basic idea is, in a sense, we call it a, a low uh, total cost of ownership that the rendezvous subscription and the rev share combined or one of those two is in total always less than having in-house tech team running the managing the system makes sense that sounds fair to me now listen mate we've had a fantastic conversation an hour has absolutely flown by as we come down to the end of our time together this is where i get to flip the script hand the microphone over to you let you ask me one question any question you like it could be personal or professional <laughs> so Philippe from Rendezvous, what is your question for me today? I have so many of them, Jason. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking which one should be my first priority. So I'll go more in a general space. So seeing that you interviewed so many uh, experts, industry experts, and also uh, having a lot of experience in B2C and D2C uh, uh, world, but now also deeping, uh, deep diving to B2B. I'm pretty sure that, or assume that you learned a lot during those interviews or discussions. So what interesting, how do you see where is the B2B commerce going? Look, I would just say in general, as an umbrella response to that, that B2B is the hot, sexy new thing. And the, what I mean by that is that COVID really showed a lot of these B2B brands, oh my God, and that we just do not have effective digital routes to market. We don't have effective digital services. We do not have customer, digital customer acquisition capability in our business. And over 60% of B2B buyers today, as we know from research, are millennials now. And so the reality is when they start looking for a supplier, they start looking online. That it's not like they go to a trade show or it's not like they go to the yellow pages anymore or they try to find out through an industry group or something like that. Okay, who's the supplier in this space? No, they Google it. Just like we do in our personal life, they Google for their new suppliers for a specific product for Widget X. If they're looking for Widget X, they're going to Google Widget X supplier, and then they're going to they're going to go to that website and they're going to look for that product and they're going to see how hard it is to be onboarded as a buyer with that supplier, and they're going to go through the process. And the reality that historically in the B two B world, catalogs have been gated. You couldn't even see what a supplier had in, in in stock or what they sold until you became a buyer, and then you authenticated. You could see the catalog, you could see your pricing, all that sort of stuff, and uh, B2B brands are slowly starting to come to the realization, oh my God, if we hide our catalog behind a gated login, even Google can't index our site. And this is a real problem. And a lot of brands, they're realizing, geez, it's great to have field sales reps, but we cannot be everywhere our potential customers are physically. We can't do it. Especially if we want to be an international business and want to sell internationally, we can't have sales teams in every country in the world. It's just not realistic. And we can't even have inside sales that are making phone calls to every potential buyer around the world. It's just not, it's just not feasible. And so they're realizing now, oh my God, this digital platform, it's not just bringing efficiencies to our business in terms of how we run our business. It's not just being, bringing efficiencies to our buyers and how they buy from us but it's also bringing efficiencies in how we acquire customers. And we're now getting in front of new customer cohorts that we would never be able to get in front of before. And so I think there's a very, it's, it's a slow realization because the B2B space traditionally has been very legacy, been very, it's been run by an older generation that thought in a different way, 
But as these businesses are being passed down generationally from parents to children and then grandchildren, oftentimes the people who are taking over these businesses are digital natives. And so it, it, it is this shift that's building momentum as the younger generation of both buyer and seller come into the market that is creating a very fast evolution of B2B. And it was, it was just, so, the, the thinking was legacy for so long, but the change, it's coming as a wave and the wave is definitely rising. And I'm seeing that everybody else who works in the B2B space as a consultant or as an agency, they're seeing it, they're seeing the demand increase. And a lot of these businesses, they realize, they realize too, that wasn't the last pandemic. If Bill Gates has anything to do with it, we're going to have a lot more. And so the, the reality is, look, we're going we're gonna to have more pandemics. We're going to have more political unrest. We're going to have disruptions to travel. Travel cost is high now. And so a lot of these businesses realize we have to, we have no choice but to develop digital routes to market and a digital services layer to our business. Otherwise, we are just not going to be in the consideration set as a supplier. To the point, I would also say it's putting businesses in danger if, if they do not uh, digitalize them in a sense and uh, make their B2B commerce more efficient and, and easier to use. No question about that. Now, listen, Philippe, if people want to get a hold of you, I'll drop your, I'll drop your LinkedIn link in the show notes. I'll drop the Rendezvous link in the show notes. Other than that, how do you like people to get a hold of you and talk about B2B e-commerce? Happy to reach out to me via LinkedIn or also to my email. It's philip at rendezvous tech. So F-I-L-I-P. I have the, the easier way of spelling Philip with less uh, letters. So F-I-L-I-P at R-A-N-D-E-V-U dot tech. Rendezvous, a French word, but in a, a techy, nerdy way of spelling. Fantastic, mate. Thank you so much for your time. It was a fantastic conversation. Can't wait to speak to you again soon. Thank you. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.